Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Shorty September, the BookTube event concentrating on the wee, sleek little things in our libraries, the little tiny things that tend to get lost between, in my case, eight and nine hundred page biographies, or big, stinking, fat new translations of Capital by Karl Marx. <laughs> So for Shorty September for 2024 myself, I have been exclusively rereading. I'm not using Shorty September to extol the virtues of any brand new or new to me tiny little things that even might appeal to me. Maybe that'll be next time. But this time it's rereads. Uh, and that has caused a lot of one of my favorite things to do, which is to get up and wander around. To get up and just wander around the shelves, <laughs> just looking at the books. I spent a lot of time doing that, just looking at the books, especially now that the little book room is under a, a really thorough renovation. Uh, uh, I'm planning now and, and partially enacting how to do even more looking at the books in that room. Uh, and I never know what's going to jump out at me. And today, well, Hannah at Hannah's Books will be happy to learn that it's a comic book. <laughs> Uh, it, it's short, but the version that I pulled off the shelf is not tiny. It's huge. It's this thing. Justice League of America, JLA, Heaven's Ladder, written by Mark Wade, uh, with artwork by Brian Hitch. This is a quarter of a century ago, and this is a time when uh, DC Comics, the home of real superheroes, Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, was, was playing around with... Uh, Issuing things in these extremely larger treasury-sized editions because all the guys that were in charge of comics at the time, they're all gone now. Mark Wade is hanging on, but all the, other, all the rest of them are gone. They've been replaced by blue-haired teenage women somewhere very, very deep on the autism spectrum who don't know or care anything about comics. But back in 2000, they, they were still around, and the guys who were in charge of all this stuff were remembering the big Marvel and DC treasury editions from their use that they love so much. So they were bringing out these larger things, uh, which I would ordinarily have written off as just a marketing gimmick, but Brian Hitch's artwork in here is so good that you actually want it in this bigger size. DC has since reprinted this in a smaller paperback, at least a paperback that I know of. I don't know if they've reprinted it in a deluxe hardcover or... Uh, any kind of an anniversary edition, they really should, because it is a fantastic comic, a fantastic Justice League adventure. Of course, one of the problems with the Justice League, the real Justice League, this is, here you've got the real Justice League, uh, which is Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, the Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, the Flash, uh, and Green Lantern. Uh, am I leaving somebody out? I don't, I don't think I am. There should be seven. Let's see. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. You're probably all screaming. For the words. I'm probably it's an obvious thing. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Aquaman, and The Martian Manhunter. Okay, yeah, seven. Uh, and uh, that presents a problem. Well, I mean, you can add people onto that. This is not the real Green Lantern, for instance. This is just some punk kid with a mask that wouldn't work. And here you have uh, Steel from the... Uh, the death of Superman, the reign of the Superman miniseries. Uh, you've got you've got Plastic Man in here as well, and a couple of other characters. But those those, the Magnificent Seven here. If it were the real Green Lantern, this would that would be the real Justice League. And you can see right away that presents a problem. Uh, maybe you can't. Not everyone is as well versed in comic book minutia as Hannah is, after all. <laughs> but it, I will gladly tell you the problem if you don't know comics, which is that that team. Uh, is mighty, mighty powerful. <laughs> that team is mighty powerful. Uh, even if, if you leave out the the masked adventures with gimmicks, so pre pre any idea of a speed force, that would be the Flash. That would certainly be Aquaman, and that would definitely be Batman. Uh, what does that leave you in a team? Well, you've got Green Lantern, who has an energy ring that can allow him to do anything that he can imagine. Basically, godlike power, limited only by his imagination. Uh, you've got Wonder Woman, the Martian Manhunter, and Superman, all of whom are strong enough to crack a planet in half with their bare hands. So that's tough. <laughs> it's it's not tough to have a team like that, but it's tough to give to get them to work up a sweat. 
you really need big storylines for the Justice League. At least writers seem to believe that. I think there are all sorts of ways to approach that problem. Certainly, it presented no difficulties for the Justice League writers all throughout the 1960s. Uh, but this is in the far more realistic year 2000. And the, the adventure here, to go along with the size of the thing, are a, a group of super quantum godlike alien beings called the Mechanics. Uh, who are using Earth and other planets as nodules and building some kind of cosmic double helix of DNA. Uh, it's, a, it's a super mega cosmic MacGuffin storyline that doesn't make any sense. It's highly unlikely that DNA, for instance, will take a double helix form anywhere else in the universe. These beings are not... What, the way they're doing it is something Mark Wade writes it in the gigantic, operatic, verisimilitude-ridden way of modern comic books. But the idea of it is taken straight from the comics that I love, from the basically silly superhero comics of the early 1960s and the late 1950s. <laughs> because the way that the mechanics are collecting these planets in order to subject them to this genetic biomatrix experiment is to pincushion them one after another like beads on a string, which of course would not work at all. That would not work at all. But nevertheless, it's done here, and it is it is convincing largely because of uh, Hitch's artwork. Look at this alien craft. Just look at that. There's Earth. Look at look at that. That is just amazing. Just incredible artwork. Uh, and that I have the smaller version of this, one of them anyway, and detail, a lot of detail is lost. That is done justice uh, in a big, big thing like this. So I, I didn't end up objecting. And for one brief second, the League is stunned, speechless. They've never seen anything of this size before. Uh, and before they can do much about it, uh, the planet is speared <laughs> and and they become part of this daisy chain of worlds that are all being gathered together and they have to do something about it now plastic man is here for comic relief mark wade knows perfectly well mark wade has actually talked about the fact that plastic man just if you look at him on the surface just on the drawing board of what his character is like he, he is a comic shapeshifter. He can, he's all silly putty and stretching his body, shaping it into anything that he wants. And Mark Wade is among the number of DC writers who've pointed out that that makes him unbelievably powerful. Uh, Frank Miller later took that to absurd levels in Dark Knight Returns Part 2. Uh, but here he's largely played for comic relief. And here the Flash is connected to this mystical thing called the Speed Force that allows him to run at basically transporter level trans-relativistic speeds. So he's much more powerful than just the ordinary Barry Allen can really run, run really fast flash. And this, of course, is in the era of, uh, of the super-competent Batman. A, a Batman who is not just a, a, uh, a costume do-gooder, but who knows a lot, who really, really can actually stand up, stand along with these titanic heroes. Uh, and they, the heroes, they, van they visit virtually every world in the DC continuity. Virtually every world is in the story in one way or another. It's a massive, epic, cosmic story. And they're getting a grip on what the mechanics want. They're getting a grip on the fact that the mechanics themselves are not evil. They're just not thinking about, what the, about the consequences of what they're doing for the inhabitants of those worlds. And they also come to realize the horrifying realization that one of the mechanics has gone rogue and taken on a humanoid form. It eventually and it emerges from the, the mechanics birthing matrix as a 90, 100 foot tall giant that's naked and bald. <laughs> uh, uh, and so at the climax of this Justice League story, when you've got all these things exploding everywhere, uh, at the end of the story, you want the League to fight somebody. You want the League to punch somebody. Otherwise, you're going to be disappointing, Hannah. 
Yes. And so, at the end of a story that is, of course, on so many levels, about so much more than just a fight, at the end of a story you have this raving, mad, 90-foot-tall, naked, bald god against the Justice League <laughs> for at least a couple of panels. And I knew that was coming when I read this the first time. I bought this big, oversized thing. It felt ridiculous bringing it home. Uh, but... I knew that that confrontation was coming, and I felt a little bit... I felt, uh, okay, Mark Wade, you're a really, really good comic book writer. Well, you, and you've set the stakes on this story so convincingly high. Surely you don't need to indulge in this, but I have to admit. I have to admit. The sequence in which it happens uh, thrills the eight-year-old in me. Uh, though some of you have pointed out that the eight-year-old in me isn't all that hard to find. <laughs> Uh, the sequence thrilled the eight-year-old in me because this this creature erupts from the birthing matrix and the, the Justice League is just looking at this thing and they want to know what the plan is. And when you need a plan in a, in a case like this, if you need a plan about what to do long-term uh, strategy, you go to Batman. If you need a battle plan, something to do on the ground in an emergency, you go to Superman. And he lays out what he wants everybody to do. Kyle and Ray, that is Green Lantern, and, and the Atom, a Justice Leaguer who can shrink to tiny size, uh, help the mechanics rebuild. That's his advice to them. And what's his advice to the rest of them? We'll handle God. <laughs> and they launch themselves at this creature. Look at that panel. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll handle God. Uh, and this is perfect for the Justice League in a way that Mark Wade would get, but that not a lot of other writers would, which is that in a case like this, Batman definitely belongs. I know it doesn't seem right. He's a Dark Knight detective of the black alleys of Gotham City, but he's a great hero. The, the writers and producers of my beloved Super Friends understood this, what, 50 years ago? <laughs> 60 years ago? And it's still true. Uh, of course, God... He's not happy with that. <laughs> and pretty much squashes them flat. But they're going to go down fighting. Uh, and so we get this massive, massive battle at the end. Uh, there is Wonder Woman and the Martian Manhunter smashing into this thing. They're, all the most powerful leaguers go at it. But they are drastically outmanned. They cannot possibly win. And eventually they end up just trashed. Green, Green Lantern's ring is out, Steel's armor is shattered, Superman is in shock. Uh, Plastic Man is taking this form because of Mark Wade is doing a little inside joke about how it ain't over until the fat lady sings. Uh, that's the sort of comic relief that Plastic Man gives throughout this whole thing. And uh, in what, in, unless Mark Wade actually tells me that I'm wrong, unless I, we actually meet in person and he tells me that I'm wrong, I'm going to believe that either he, I don't actually remember, when did the movie Mystery Men come out? The sublime movie Mystery Men with uh, Ben Stiller. When did that movie come out? Uh, if it came out before the year 2000, then I believe Mark Wade was riffing on that movie. And if it came out after the year 2000, then that movie, I believe, was riffing on Mark Wade because there's no chance that this is a coincidence because the Justice League, uh, totally, uh, totally beaten, totally defeated by this giant god, decide to, to that their last hope is a group hug. <laughs> and any of you who, are, who know that, that movie that I love so much, any of you who know that movie will be remembering what, what, what the, the importance of that is. Uh, but the most interesting thing, because the, the mechanics are gods. They transcend all kinds of realities. And the Justice League knows that. And... In the course of the adventure, while they're figuring out how things are working and how to fight back against them, there's lots and lots of dialogue, and Mark Waid is great at that. He is so good at realizing DC superheroes. Of course, he wrote Kingdom Come. He's written a lot. His individual issues are every bit as good. You can get him, get him to write an individual issue of The Old Brave and the Bold. It'll be great. Everybody will be in character, and also you'll think something new about them. Uh... I have heard all sorts of rumors in the industry that he is a raging a-hole, but he is a great comic book writer. And all throughout this issue, because of the semi-divine nature of the beings they're fighting, the Justice League is talking in their off moments about metaphysical questions, about life and also the afterlife. What do they all think about the afterlife? And that's when you remember that the Justice League, they, 
in the old Mike Zukowski days, they all looked exactly the same, but they come from radically different backgrounds. Most of them do. Radically different. Uh, and therefore, it stands to reason they would have drastically different views about the afterlife. I want to read you a couple of Mark Wade's examples of that, because eventually he gets around to every leaguer in terms of what they think about the afterlife. For instance, The Flash uh, tells Aquaman uh, that his idea is that there's they all the super speedsters enter the speed force and live inside it they become part of this extra dimensional force that allows them to run unrealistically fast faster than flesh and blood could run uh and he asks uh what about the atlanteans uh aquaman's own people what about them what do they think about the afterlife and aquaman says in death we become one with the inky depths of the ocean. Below the knowledge of light, we float forever, wide and weightless, silent witnesses to the dark above a sea-soaked landscape older than time. Every creature of the sea, from the mighty whale to the merman to the turtle to the glistening mussels, shed of their shells, becomes the very salt that buoys the teeming life beyond them. And needless to say, the Flash is a little wowed by that. <laughs> that is that is kind of impressive. Uh, we are told, for instance, that the uh, the Colloan people, the the people of my own beloved Brainiac Five in the Legion of Superheroes, uh, trust that death is an uploading of consciousness. That somewhere there is a mind cache containing reality's ultimate answer. To which. Uh, Plastic Man yells out, 42, 42, <laughs> near. You'll either get that or you won't. Uh, but, for instance, uh, we have a great fight scene with this kid, Green Lantern, and Wonder Woman. This is the real Wonder Woman. Mark Waid is not, he's not interested in any dumb, sexist re reduction of Wonder Woman. This is a Wonder Woman who can maneuver and fight alien warships in space. She is as powerful as Superman. She doesn't doesn't need breathing apparatus or a space suit or gliding on air currents or anything like that. Uh, and the kid Green Lantern wants to know, what about the Amazons? What's their view of the afterlife? Uh, and she says, uh, the ancient Greeks bequeathed to us the lesson that death is but a dismal state. All men and women, from the greatest to the most ignoble, are eventually reclaimed by the soul of Mother Earth. The only way to deny death, then, is to live each day to its absolute fullest, by constantly striving to carve an immortal legend which will serve as your eternal legacy by making the extraordinary look easy. Uh, <laughs> this, this crash scene, of course, dispenses with the ridiculous idea that Wonder Woman is not invulnerable, of course. She she deflects bullets with her bracelets, but she can survive anything. She's as powerful as Superman. Uh, but, uh, naturally, the highlight here, I, I've, I've commented on this before on this channel because there are some comic book moments, some comic book details, bits of writing or artwork that I think are just perfect. Just plain perfect. Now that bit about Wonder Woman is perfect, and that, that bit about Aquaman is really good too. Uh, but naturally, no offense intended to fans of any of these other characters, but naturally you want to know about Superman and Batman, right? The two most popular, legendary, and well-known superheroes of them all, anywhere, anywhere in the world. You want to know about them. Uh, and the Atom, Ray Palmer, is especially interested when he's talking to Superman, because at this point, keep in mind, in the year 2000, Superman has very publicly died. <laughs> We've gone over this on this channel before, and on Epic Comic Book Wednesday, there is a storyline where Superman dies. And Ray Palmer wants to know, well, for, you're back now, but for a while you were dead. Can you tell me what heaven's like? And Superman asks him, well, what makes you think I went to heaven? And Ray Palmer has a great comeback where he says, well, heck, if you didn't make it, what hope do the rest of us have? <laughs> but he, he, uh, he asks Superman, what do you think Batman thinks about the afterlife? When he envisions it, when he dreams about it, what is it? And Superman thinks, well, I haven't asked him. We haven't talked about it, but I imagine that he thinks he'll be with his parents again. Which is great. It's simple and it's great. And as simple and great as that is, the answer Superman gives himself is even greater. A, a worse writer would have delved into Kryptonian mythology here. But instead... Uh... Oh, uh... The Adam asks him, do you remember anything about what it was like to be dead? In other words, what's your, what's your perfect vision 
of what it's like to be dead. And Superman says, a sensation that at long last, whatever I had to do next, it could wait. <laughs> perfect. Absolutely perfect. All of it. All of it, just perfect, and only 70 pages, so it certainly counts for short in September. <laughs> I, was, uh, I don't need much of an, uh, uh, an impetus to read this again. I really don't. I love it. I love it so much, but, but it counts as short in September. It's nice and short, and it is pitch perfect. Uh, you have to pardon the background noise. It's 85 degrees. It's 85% humidity. It is a beautiful, bright, blushed, blue-skied midsummer day. Uh, we are predicted, we're coming off our, this is our 310th midsummer day like this. We are predicted to have another 100, as far out as the radar can tell. Uh, I think on January 24th at around 4 o'clock, it's going to be cold. It's not going to freeze. Don't be ridiculous. And it's certainly not going to snow. Uh, those of you too young to remember, snow is particulate per precipitation that is white that falls out of the sky on when the temperature is generally very cold unthinkably cold uh and that's not going to happen at all but uh but i think on january 24th from like one to three in the afternoon it's going to be cold otherwise uh, it's going to be a summer day where people are driving around with no shirts on so uh, but anyway <laughs> anyway uh that is my shorty September for today. It is Heaven's Ladder by the great Mark Wade. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and who knows what tiny thing I'll add to the pile tonight. I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.